Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I've, uh, my wife, uh, and Cindy, and myself, this is our third time we visited Western Australia together. And uh, the first time, to answer Paul's question, uh, it was a sabbatical leave. And normally, as you know, you put in a lot of, uh, there's a lot of paperwork to fill out to, for sabbatical leaves. And I pointed out to our dean that I was going to go as far away from him as I possibly could. So I just wrote one line. My sabbatical application was one line. I am going to get away from, as far away from you as I possibly can. And I hand-delivered the letter. And about 30 minutes later, his assistant came back with a reply. I opened up the letter and a massive big stamp on it. <laughs> Approved. <laughs> So we ended up here, and uh, we've had uh, great times here. Uh, you all know how wonderful a place this is. We've had some great times here. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is, was there a late pro neoprotozoic supercontinent? Why does it matter? And I noticed I'm being taped. Now, I've drank many gallons of Guinness over many years, but I've never been taped drinking a, a pint of Guinness at all. So this is the first time. Cheers, everyone. Mm. OK. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce my co-author, who sort of snuck in under the radar. This is Damien Nance over here, sipping away on his pint in the corner. Um, Damien didn't tell us he was coming until the very last minute. Otherwise, I would have substituted him in here to give this talk. And one of the reasons is that uh, Damien was at ground zero when this concept of the supercontinent cycle was advocated. Damien and his colleagues Tom Worsley and the late Judith Moody in the 1980s wrote a, a series of uh, really provocative papers. And I think Damien, uh, 1988 was the first time the word supercontinent cycle was used in a... Close. Close. Okay. So, um, what is it? It's uh, the notion that Pangaea is only the most recent supercontinent, and Earth history uh, is punctuated by episodic assembly and breakup of supercontinents. And over the last 30 years, this concept has gained widespread support, so that there's lots of uh, sort of uh, um, research groups uh, actually actively engaged in, in trying to understand the where, the when, the why, and the how. And even uh, Pangaea, which is just the latest of supercontinents, and this is a 300 million year reconstruction, uh, we know to a first order where and when, but we're still trying to work out the dynamics of why and how. So, um, as Damien alluded to 30 years ago, there is, uh, Pangaea is just the latest in a series of supercontinents that have punctuated Earth history. So, this is 300 million years ago. The others, People are still working out on the details. Uh, and uh, if you check the literature, there are different reconstructions for different time periods. But pretty near everybody agrees that there was a supercontinent about a billion years ago that's given the name Rodinia. Before that, there was one uh, uh, called either Columbia or Nuna, depending on your bias, uh, about 1.5 to 1.7 uh, billion years ago. And before that, perhaps a little more sketchily, uh, something called Kunoland. Uh, 2.7 billion years ago. Uh, the one that perhaps is the most controversial is whether this supercontinent, variously known as Pinocha, or some of you are more familiar with the word Gondwana, I'll try to explain the difference between them a little later, existed about 590 million years ago. Uh, and so that's sort of the debate uh, that we're going to engage in tonight, and maybe it'll point out the significance of that debate as well. So first, uh, acknowledging uh, great friends, Cecilio Casada here in the back row. Uh, we're part of, and Rob Strachan, who was actually in Perth as well, but had the good sense. He's probably now sitting in a pub in Claysbrook, sipping on a, on a beer. He's heard this talk before, so he's uh, had the good sense to, uh, um, to go somewhere else this evening. And then there's a, the Curtain Mafia, who we've engaged in uh, over the last oh, several visits now, uh, Lee and Bill, who's uh, going to be part of the Heckle community here in the front, near the front row, Sergei Pizarevsky, Ross Mitchell, Chris Spencer, and Martin, and Lei Wu, who I'm now sharing office with this, this, this year. And it's been an absolutely terrific experience. Okay, 
we're in the Irish club. Um, I have to warn you that nearly 15 years ago, this is me kissing the Blarney Stone. Now, you know that the colouring is a little different than over the last 15 years. This is me kissing the Blarney Stone. Now, I don't know if you've ever kissed the Blarney Stone, but you have to hang yourself upside down. Uh, well, they hang you upside down. And you kiss a little stone out here dangling out over the edge. But then they give you the certificate. You kiss the world-famous Blarney Stone, and you're now sent forth with the gift of eloquence. So I'll leave you to decide whether uh, that holds. Okay, so what are we going to discuss here? Uh, the supercontinent cycle as a concept. I'm going to give you some historical context of uh, how this uh, supercontinent, the proposal of the supercontinent pronotia, how that notion came about. Give you a little snapshot of the current understanding. Uh, obviously, we can't go back in a time capsule, so I'll give you a sort of a feeling for how we amass evidence for the existence or, or, easy, or debate the existence of this supercontinent. But for, for our purposes, I think one of the main points, uh, it, the take home message is if this is a major supercontinent, did it affect global scale circulation in the mantle? For those of you uh, who may not have a geology background, that's underneath the lithosphere, so deep within the Earth. Did this supercontinent affect that? And if it did, then its legacy must be included in any uh, attempt to understand how the latest supercontinent formed, which is Pangaea. And the next thing is, how can we tell? We stop waving arms. How can we go out in the field and, and test whether this supercontinent existed? So, there are the goals. So, obviously, if... Um, if you go from one supercontinent to the next, well, through time, start this way and go through to, to Colombia and Nuna, then on to Rodinia, possibly Pinocchio, and on to Pangaea. Obviously, in between times, whoops, excuse me, uh, in between times, the supercontinent must have broken up, only to reform again, only to break up and reform again. And several years ago, uh, people like Paul Hoffman and uh, Charles Hartnady were a little ahead of us in this, but we, we showed that... Uh, or we propose that maybe there are different ways of looking at how the supercontinent may form and, and reassemble. So here's a supercontinent, it may split up and form brand new oceans. If you want to think of it in modern terms, you can think of Pangaea splitting up and forming, progressively forming the Atlantic Ocean in between the drifting blocks. And then there's two N-member ways, and I stress N-member ways, in which the next supercontinent could form. Um, it could form by closure, we would call it subduction of the oceans in between these blocks to give you the next supercontinent, which actually would be quite similar to the, its predecessor. So it's almost in this sort of thought experiment as if the Atlantic started to close, you bring back in the continents again, and it would almost resemble what Pangaea was. So like an accordion, open close. Another end member is if the Atlantic continued to open and progressively widen, then the continents could clearly wrap around the other side and collide again, and that would mean the Pacific Ocean would close, in which case this is an end member case we call extroversion. Or more likely, there's likely to be some combination of those two end members. Then, a few years later, uh, Ross Mitchell and his colleagues, Ross is now at, uh, at uh, Curtin, I shared office with him uh, a couple of years ago, um, and he proposed, that, and his colleagues proposed, that the Earth is likely to develop uh, two mass uh, upwellings, we call them super plumes or super swells, deep within the Earth, maybe 2,900 kilometers down, and the continents essentially migrate away from these, uh, these highs towards what he calls a girdle, um, where they would congregate along this blue band in here. Uh, this would sort of bisect the distance between these two upwellings. And the consequence he called that orthoversion. Um, so on breakup, this girdle forms a ring of downwelling, which the continent fragments gather. So the next supercontinent is 90 degrees away from the previous one, a concept called orthoversion. Very elegant concept. And so if you look at the, at the distribution of where these heat anomalies are today, well, this is like cat scanning of the Earth. You can look at these anomalies. They're 2,900 kilometers below the surface, these uh, super plumes. This is one underneath Africa, one underneath the Pacific. So there's our two uh, thermal highs, if you like. And this blue area here is at this girdle of downwelling towards which the continents would migrate. 
So, why does the resolution of this supercontinent, understanding of this supercontinent cycle, why does it matter at all? Um, well, we can show that the cycle has profoundly influenced the evolution of the Earth systems. By that we mean uh, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, the biosphere, as well obviously the, the solid Earth. And it's likely that this cycle has affected the rock record more than any other geologic phenomenon because it is all-encompassing and very uh, uh, a long-lasting cycle. And may have documented the fundamental aspects of the Earth's interior probably for the last two and a half billion years, maybe more. So, a flavor of the debate about whether this Panosha supercontinent exists or not. You'll probably get the slurp on the tape now. Eh? Okay, so the problem is the data set sort of permits the existence of paleomagnetic data, permits the existence of the supercontinent, but is by no means a proof of it. And also, uh, as more age data is gathered, and in the last 20 years it's, get, it's been, become more common to get very precise age data, uh, some of that data, or a lot of it, suggests that the breakup of the supercontinent might have been underway before the supercontinent was fully assembled. So uh, that would be like uh, getting divorced before you're married. It's not, uh, it's not exactly the best thing to happen. Okay, so a bit of historical context is how this uh, developed. I guess it traces back uh, to the 1970s to a concept by Valentine and Moores, and what they were actually looking at was a diversity of, of fauna throughout the last 500 million years. Um, so going from 550 million years ago to today, and you can see that there's a rapid rise in the diversity of fauna, uh, and then a decrease when uh, this is the time pa period of Pangaea, and then a rapid rise again. And based on this rapid rise in fauna diversity mirroring that of what happened with Pangaea, Valentine and Moore's proposed that, that this supercontinent probably split up, generating good habitats and continental shells. Uh, and we now know lots of nutrients coming into those oceans uh, to give you this faunal diversity. And so maybe that this had the same integrity as, as Pangaea, but just 300 million years earlier. And uh, as the data was gathered years later, so this is 1990, the same essential concept still holds that uh, total diversity, even with more data, is still pretty clear with the breakup, potential breakup of a supercontinent giving you that diversity, mirroring what happened with Pangaea. So then uh, push the clock forward to 1981, and as paleomagnetic data became more common, uh, Matt Williams claimed that the paleomagnetic data supported the existence of Pangaea. Uh, in 1984, Jared Bond and his colleagues uh, did a lot of detailed work looking at the passive margins. For those of you who have passive margins, that just means as a, as a continent would break up, it would generate continental shelves. And he did a lot of detailed work on the substance of these continental shelves, noting that there was a lot of them at that time reflecting the breakup of fragments. So if there was a breakup of fragments, it suggested that there was a supercontinent that existed before that. And then Chris Powell of University of Western Australia actually christened the name Penosha using it um, from a Stump, uh, who previously um, gave it a, a more local name. But uh, obviously there's a UWA connection in there too. And this is the reconstruction in 1992 proposed by Ian DL for this Penosha. It actually contains these fragments in here, which most of us would uh, recognize as parts of Gondwana, but in addition to Gondwana, it has Laurentia, so ancestral North America, and Baltica, so ancestral Western Europe. So, there, since that time, there have been various proposals for what Panosha might uh, consist of. Um, a lot of work has been done on it, and you can see some, here's one just published last year, so, oh gosh, there's some seas in here, the oceans in there. Some of the fits are just not that tight. And so a lot of people debate whether this uh, exists as an entity or not. Um, one thing's for sure. If it did exist, it only existed fleetingly. Uh, and I think everybody would agree with that. That's what the bulk of the data would suggest. Um, but as continents are coming together, they don't necessarily fit together tongue and groove. 
Uh, they collide with promontories first, and there might be some re-entrance and embayments. And so continental collision is a very complicated thing. And if you look at the uh, uh, more recent example in the eastern Mediterranean, here's Arabia already collided with this part of Turkey and into Asia, and uh, the Mediterranean Sea is still subducting. It's still trying to close. And so in these ancient origins, when we start trying to look at the ages of collision, very often the end games, the late collisions are these Mediterranean type of collisions. And maybe we should be uh, focusing really on the onset of the collisions rather than their termination because many of these terminations are sort of Mediterranean type tectonics. So if you do that, you could argue that the bulk of it assembled at about 620. Uh, and there, maybe there's bits and pieces kept assembling after that. Um, the breakup, which Gerard Bond first thought was about 625 or so, since that time, the time scale has been worked on and worked on, and the breakup may be recalibrated 605 to 620. So the bulk assembly at 620 and the, and the breakup from 605 to 520, a lawyer could claim that it existed for, for 15 million years. But if it existed, definitely only fleetingly. Okay, so now I want to change perspective. Uh, Instead of being so focused on the surface of the Earth and the crust, try visualizing this looking up from the mantle. And ask yourself the question, does the mantle actually recognize whether these, if they get close enough, do they actually recognize whether the continents are touching or not? Um, so, because what we're trying to assess is whether this, this panosia actually affected global mantle convection patterns. Um, so what we would claim is supercontinent status and the criteria size, how big it was, was it bigger than Pangaea? Uh, if it's not as big as Pangaea, somebody would say, many people would say it's not really a supercontinent. Um, instead of getting bent out of shape about the terminology, let's try and think about the processes and the processes in the mantle are absolutely fundamentally important. Um, how did it affect global mantle convection? And it's one thing to wave one arm and say, oh, it probably did, but how would we actually recognize it? How would this be expressed in the geological record? So the last part of the talk is going to really speculate on various places where this might happen. Does it happen? No idea. Uh, but places where one could go to investigate whether this, uh, the effects can be seen. Um, because if the effects can be seen, then Pinocchio and its legacy were in, definitely influenced early Paleozoic, so 500 million year old mantle convection patterns. And if they did on a global scale, then we need to understand these and uh, factor them in if we're ever going to understand how our latest supercontinent Pangaea formed. I still yet, in many years of teaching, haven't been asked the most embarrassing question yet by an undergraduate student. If a student asked me, uh, okay, I understand that Pangaea existed, but how did Pangaea form? I'd have to t say to the student, I don't know. So, uh, there's going to be few answers. Uh, hopefully, uh, by the end of the talk, you'll see there's a way out. There's a way of investigating this. So, let's look at some of the record. Obviously, you can't go back in the time machine, so we're doing everything by proxy. Uh, we're doing everything indirectly. So what can we uh, say about supercontinents? What would it require? It requires continental collision. And so an obvious proxy for that is global scale mountain building activity in a very narrow window of time. And so it's been known for 40, 50 years or maybe even earlier since, the, since uh, radiometric dating became common that uh, there's a series of mountain building events called the Pan-African and now connected to areas along the, uh, the, the Gondwanan margin and connected up to other areas, the, uh, into the Timonides, etc. that there's a lot of collisional belts and subduction related belts of the age of 650 to, to 550 million years. So each of these collisional belts that you see in the dark uh, colors in here represent sites of vanished oceans where there's been subduction in between uh, uh, these Fragments have collided with one another, the mountains have been built, 
and those mountains create a, a lot of record that can be seen. So you can see the sort of evidence that's compiled in these reconstructions. This is reconstructions by Lee, who you know at Curtin University, and, uh, and all his colleagues, his many colleagues. And you can see um, there's a sort of consensus that there's Rodinia splitting up, gener oh, sorry, generating these oceans. These oceans start to close by subduction, and then these new Pan-African belts form by these continental collisions. So the supercontinent assembly requires lots of continental collisions. Uh, this, is th this Pan-African, uh, etc. belt is recognized as one of the largest in Earth history. And one of the proxies we use to sort of uh, figure this out and decode how big that is, is looking at the very resistant minerals that crystallize out of magma chambers during these events. And these uh, survive the test of time. And so by, by uh, retrieving them from all sorts of sources and plotting their distribution through time, we can figure out the age of these major orogenic systems. So it's sort of a proxy. So here is uh, a sort of one set of formations from that. This was from Mirt. And you're looking at the numbers of detrital zircons over billions of years. So this is the last 3,500 million year record. And you can see several peaks. These correspond with the supercontinents that we've uh, talked about. But here's a peak here for Pinocha, and there's another peak for Pangaea. So uh, as a proxy, it passes that test. That it's producing a lot of magmatism. Those magmatisms are producing a lot of zircons. Those zircons are very uh, resistive through time. And so uh, we can retrieve them. And you can see the statistical um, population is showing that this was a major magmatic uh, episode in history of magmatic event. There's all sorts of other proxies that can be used. Uh, Damien has written up a paper recently about this, uh, and it's, it's done in detail. I don't have time to go through all of them. I'll go through some of them uh, just to give you a flavor of, of how this works. So, uh, a lot, what this means is that these continental blocks that to come together, there's a lot of collisions between them, which means the subduction zones in between them uh, must founder and collide down into the deep earth. And that's something to remember for later because that will be important when we're trying to figure out what, how we may recognize the existence of Panosha in the record. So this is more or less uh, just showing you the same sort of thing. There's all sorts of compilations. This is one done by Condi and After in 2010. They're looking at all sorts of data. They're looking at ancient detrital sediments. They're looking at modern river sediments. They're looking at, at granites through time. And it doesn't matter which data set you use, and the combination of them all gives you these peaks. And these peaks correspond with supercontinents. And so basically what it means is, as these zircons crystallize in magma chambers, it doesn't matter where they end up in the rock cycle, as they travel around through the rock cycle, if you retrieve them, even from modern sediments, and, uh, and get a statistical distribution of them, you'll get a peak that corresponds with the uh, peaks associated with supercontinent assemblies. Okay, so we're in an Irish center. Excuse me, I'm going to have another sip. Part of an Irishman's duty is, when you get the chance, is to rib off the Scots. <laughs> That's what I'm about to do. Especially as we're playing them in a must-win rugby match on Saturday, Sunday morning, your time, or our time. So, in doing so, I'm going to make the point that we're trying to trace back rock heritage through time. We're tracing back rock heritage through time is analogous broadly to tracing back human heritage. For those, so those of you who deal with other aspects of geology or maybe um, don't have a geology background, I'll just give you a flavor of it. Uh, I use the Scots to do so. So we live, Cindy and I live in Nova Scotia, which as I've told you is more or less antipodal from here. But Nova Scotia, New Scotland. Celtic heritage to beat the band. Too much of it. Well, Scottish bagpipes. So, uh, the, the, many of these, uh, the Scotch heritage has been going on for, uh, through boatloads of people and now plane loads of people coming over for hundreds of years. And, and, over time, they lose some of their traits. So the first, thing, the first thing that they would lose 
is their accent. I mean, I've been out of Ireland for several decades now, and my Irish accent has sort of uh, got compromised over time. I'm sure I don't know almost anybody in Nova Scotia who still eats porridge, and absolutely, haggis is just no way. Feuds, you're not sure on a pub on a Saturday night whether some of these feuds are being rekindled or not. But some things do t uh, stand the test of time. Surnames get handed on from generation to generation. Fiddle music, still in Nova Scotia, is some excellent fiddle music, and some people would claim it's closer to the Scottish tradition than, than in Scotland today, and dancing is a big thing as well. So some things stand the test of time and are robust, like surnames. Other things are dropped almost instantly. And the rock record is like that. Some things in the rock record are very fickle. They don't last hardly one part of the cycle. But zircons are an example of something that is completely robust, tiny little crystals, very, very tight structure, very, very stable, and they house within them the decay of materials over time. And so they are an example of the equivalent of a surname. And so that's a lot of the rock record then is basically useless for tracking back heritage, but you zoom in on things that are robust in doing so. So the Scots would like to portray themselves as suave, sophisticated, and you're taping this, right? Suave, sophisticated, uh, 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 and all that. So this is maybe what uh, a standard Scot might look like, have looked like at the turn of the century. But we can't, we can't be fooled by that because we know we wind back the clock about 400 years, the stereotypical Scot looked more like this, <laughs> right? So, what we have clearly is an evolution of the, of the, of the homeland from, well, from here to here over the last 400 years or so, right? So, uh, Scottish history has been punctuated by lots of events, most of them distasteful events, so, battles, uh, Glencoe, Culloden and the like, uh, the Highland clearances just after that, uh, the, the, the Scottish famine was nowhere near deep and as wide as the Irish famine, but it existed nevertheless. And each time some of these major events happened, there were boatloads of Scots that went to the New World, including to New Scotland. And so, if you now take the, the, today, the, the Scots that are in Nova Scotia, they've come from away, from, some from, uh, from back from famine times, some from the Highland Clearances, etc., etc. And they will trace their way back to that. So they go back generation to generation to generation and trace their way back to that time and say, oh, we were part of the Highland Clearances. Well, we do the same thing with, with very resistant material rocks. We would measure something in them today, and we can back calculate, if you like, that's probably overstating uh, the, the complexity of it. We can backtrack through time to a time where the geological events happened, right? So, oh yes, and then of course there are recent Scots who probably would still have their accent, right? So we translate this into uh, geological events. This could be the evolution of something that we're interested in measuring. Some, uh, to get a little bit more technical, some isotopic feature you might be interested in measuring. This is how it evolved over time in its source, which is underneath the lithosphere, down deep within the Earth, something we call the mantle. And then these major tectonic events would uh, form these, uh, these stable bits of crust, and they would decay over time, or they would migrate over time as they moved into the crust with a different signal. And so, over time, they would depart from their homeland, just like the Scots uh, that uh, left after Culloden uh, have, have lost more of their Scottish features than the ones that, that, that have just arrived, basically. So, it's not a very difficult uh, concept, um, but what we use this to backtrack things through time. So, just, uh, you don't need to worry about details or anything like that. So, here's just a couple of proxies. Um, and this arrow here is about the time that Panosha formed. And so what this measures, this little trough in here measures, it's hafnium, uh, that's, uh, it's an isotopic system that's in that robust mineral zircon, and it nosedives at about the time that Panosha forms. And what that tells us is that when it gets down deep, that it's left the mantle and it's getting recycled and recycled, 
And this is consistent then with, with this, these continents coming together, grinding together, and recycling material in and around those orogenic events. Um, here's another uh, uh, proxy in here. This is uh, looking at uh, heavy oxygen isotopes, and that indicates reworking of, of sedimentary material, which again consistent with forming a mountains and, and a, 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 a strong interval of reworking. Um, when Another sort of proxy is looking at sea level. Sea level actually changes. I often tell my students that you should consider an ocean basin like a bathtub that's full to the brim. And if you step into the bathtub, obviously water is going to move up and out. And so when supercontinents form, like in the case of Pangaea and possibly Penosha, um, there's very low sea level, global sea level. Why? Because the continent, there's a whole bunch of processes go on underneath the continent to trap heat underneath it, which means it gets elevated. And when it gets elevated, that means sea level relatively drops. That's one of the um, manifestations of supercontinents. And when they break up, sea levels start to rise. More about that in a couple of minutes. So it's true for Pangaea, but, but Pinocchio also has that signal. Also, um, as you know, for the, those of you who took, uh, well, yeah, you, this is sort of general knowledge, is that in the reconstruction of Pangaea, then one of the major things he used was glacial deposits. So these glacial deposits are 300 million years old or so, um, and they reflected the drawdown of uh, uh, greenhouse gases to enhance weathering and climate deterioration as the supercontinent basically forms. And you can see here on this plot, this is the last billion years, so this is 300 million years ago. Here's these ice house conditions that, that accompanied the formation of Pangaea. Well, those same conditions existed 600 million years ago, 650 million years ago at the time of, uh, that Pannotia formed. And there are two major glacial events. They've got names in them here. They're not really particularly important, but they coincide with the assembly of, of the supercontinent. And if you look... This is uh, Paul Hoffman's uh, um, photo of glacial deposits uh, that's 635 million years old in, in Namibia. And uh, you can see since the, that time, there's been lots of these deposits uh, discovered in different parts of the world. So this is a, a, a very widespread glaciation. Some people call it snowball earth. Um, what about breakup? Well, a breakup, there's a lot of processes going on underneath the continent that trap heat underneath it. And so, like many things that are made today, they have inbuilt obsolescence. They really can't survive. And so, one of the first manifestations of that is injections of hot molten material. These are, they're called mafic dikes, so iron and magnesium rich material that's coming out of the mantle, injecting into the crust that's already there. And Sergei Pizarevsky, also at Curtin, uh, in this reconstruction several years ago, well, 10 years ago now, uh, showed that if you look at the, the relationship in ancient South America or the northern part of South America, ancestral North America, uh, Western Europe, the Baltic areas of, of Europe, that there was a lot of magmatic activity. You can see these numbers here, 595, 564, etc., reflecting the breakup of these uh, three uh, continental fragments. So this would be, reflect the breakup of the supercontinent Pinocchio. Oh, thank you. Okay. So, uh, as sea level curves, well, I've already talked about that. When the, when the supercontinent breaks up, sea level rises. But there are several reasons for that. But one of the reasons, uh, by analogy with the bathtub, is if you create a new ocean ridge, the water gets displaced upwards, outwards, up over the continents. And as you might imagine, when the supercontinent splits apart, you create new continental shelves and lots of uh, passive margins. So you get that signal as well with Pinocchio, just as you would with Pangaea. And I think we can skip some of these. Um, so the next part of the talk actually deals with uh, sort of the mantle perspective. How can we uh, recognize this in the rock record. Instead of just analytical stuff, how can we actually go out and look at some of the manifestations of it? So when and how did the mantle respond to this amalgamation? How can we recognize it in the record? So I can skip that too. All right. And I think I've shown that before. Okay. So what actually happens in these subduction zones? So now we're going to start talking about what actually happens in the mantle below the 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 
potential supercontinent. So these are the, this is uh, the world of Mariama in 2007. There's several publications like this, but this will certainly do for our purposes. Here's our um, crustal fragments colliding, the subduction zones in between them are uh, subducting down. Some people claim they would pond at about 660 kilometers depth. They might pond for a while before they'll founder down to the core mantle boundary. And when they get down to the core mantle boundary, they sit there and fester, they sort of blanket that boundary, sit there and fester, and that downwelling over time becomes an upwelling. So this is generating one of those super plumes I showed you earlier. Um, so as eloquently stated by Ross, Ross Mitchell, 2012, a supercon aggregates over a mantle downwelling, but then influences mantle convection on a global scale to create an upwelling underneath the landmass. So the downwelling becomes an upwelling, and that upwelling becomes part of the, of the inbuilt obsolescence as to why Panosha would break up. So a model by Li and his colleague Zhang from 2007-2009 um, sort of uh, gives you another flavor of that. Here's uh, the way mantle convection would start to organize itself. And when it starts to organize itself, the blue reflects where is a downwelling, so down to the core mantle boundary. Uh, what that does is it draws the continental fragments into it. That, that downwelling becomes an upwelling. So the aggregates of a mantle downwelling which evolves to become an upwelling. That gives you that second zone of upwelling in here. And that, you have an upwelling here, an upwelling antipodal to it. That generates the girdle. And we, we won't worry about that. And so, as I showed you earlier, that this, you can see the effects of that today. There's our two... Uh, Super plumes, these exist 2,900 kilometers below the surface near the core mantle boundary, and then bisected by this girdle of downwelling. Um, what's also important about this diagram is all these little circles in here, these red dots and circles. Um, this is a diagram uh, put out by Torsvik et al. There's several versions of this. But what's really important here, um, and it's perhaps a way to recognize whether Panosha existed, is around the edges of these super plumes, there are these hot spots, there, there are kimberlites, those of you know that they, 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 they related to the diamond deposits, large igneous provinces and the like. In other words, evidence of upwelling from deep within the Earth's interior. So, if you look at some other uh, dynamic models of what might happen, this is, this is the, the subducted graveyard, if you like, at the core mantle boundary. And this is modeled by Tan, Gurness uh, and others. And they show these plumes elevating from the core mantle boundary uh, along the edges of the graveyard. So here we go again. Here's a subduction slab graveyard. And here's these plumes emanating from that. And you see this festering uh, buildup of heat in here may eventually generate this massive super plume which will break through. Whenever it gets to that stage, we don't know. But what is really important here is that these generate plumes along the edges of the graveyard which then come up and affect the supercontinent below. So if we look at our situation 600 million years ago, these are our fragments of Gondwana, where, which came together, subduction zones in between, foundering down to the core mantle boundary. Laurentia, on the other hand, had no subduction zones within it. And so you'd expect, therefore, these, uh, these um, plumes of material to affect the margins of Gondwana, but one of the tests in it is it should not be affecting the margins of Laurentia. It, obviously the eastern margin, as we will currently look at it, but not necessarily the western margin. So, if we now go back to look at Sergei's reconstruction again, and some other reconstructions since that time, you can see perhaps there's now an alternative way to understand how the breakup and the, the Iapetus Ocean which is a major ocean in the Paleozoic, how that potentially might have formed. So maybe it's the edge effects of living on the edge of this graveyard that plumes emanating from underneath impinge on that region and open up that, this ocean. So you can see it here in this global reconstruction here at about 600, it would sit right there just where Ancestral North America is about to depart from um, the northern part of South America. We call Amazonia. I think I can skip that. Oh, the other important aspect then of that is that one of the barriers to understanding perhaps the, the 
impingement of the plumes is that the, the, the subduction zones, when they founder in between the continental box, they actually move to the periphery. And so you can see this little symbol in here all along the edge of going down these little bars in there, telling you there were subduction zones going underneath that margin. So the plumes, as they're rising from this graveyard, 2,900 kilometers below the surface, have to encounter these subduction zones. Uh, not at Laurentia, where they can easily break through, but there are their barriers to them along the Gondwana margin. So this makes it a challenge to find the manifestations of the plumes. So, and this challenge might be, uh, become more uh, obvious when you look at modern geodynamic models. These geodynamic models, this darker red in here is actually a plume. Here's our subduction zone. And these models actually tell us that plumes don't have the vigor to penetrate through subduction zones. They tend to get destroyed by them, dragged downwards. So if that's the case, how will we ever recognize the manifestation at the surface? And if we can't recognize the manifestation at the surface, how do we know whether the mantle convection patterns have been affected? Well, there may be some ways. The, there are models in here that suggest the plumes will exploit any weaknesses in slabs they can find. Fractures, gaps, like that, within the, the slab itself. And maybe some of the plume material might invade into what we call the upper plate and give us that manifestation, heat some of that material and give us that manifestation. Well, here's a possibility along the northern margin of Gondwana. Models we put out for many years without even thinking about this process at all um, show that the end of this subduction was probably related to a collision with a ridge, very similar to the generation of the modern San Andreas fault system, where you can see here's our ridge colliding as we go through time, and as it collides, it generates the San Andreas fault, which gets longer and longer over time. What's important, though, is behind that contact, right in here, there's a gap in the slab. And where there's a gap in the slab, the plume material might get through. So, also many years ago, more years than we would like to recall, uh, Cecilio uh, Quesada and his colleague uh, Teresa Sanchez Garcia put out a model in, uh, about how plumes of influence of this time period, you see about 600 to 500 million years ago, influenced the opening up of another ocean known as the Rayak Ocean. This is, a, is the plume getting subducted in here. Uh, what this insight might give us is how the plume may have got there. What, what was the trigger for the plume itself? Also in Spain, there's a very enigmatic magmatic event that's uh, 490 to 470 million years old. It's known as the Oyo de Sapo. Is that correct pronunciation, Cecilia? Oyo de Sapo? Thank you. All right. Uh, should have heard me try to pronounce paella last night. <laughs> anyway, so um, 495 to 470 million years ago, a very, very uh, distinctive suite of rocks. Loads of mega crisps, things you can recognize uh, all over in these different plumes. They affected all the risk and massifs. And it looks as though a lot of it erupted in a short period of time. It's known as the Silicic Large Igneous Province. There's no obvious trigger for that. Maybe the plume could be investigated as a trigger. And so this is all maybe. This is things that maybe people can follow up on, suggestions for things to follow up on. Maybe this is related to one of those plumes coming along on the margins. So I can skip that. So it's Sappho. I can go through that. Then, this is just dotting through various other localities in the literature that you can see that potentially have the effect of this plume, all the way along, or plumes, I should say, along the length of Gondwana various places, even potentially in Australia. So you can track it all the way along here like that, and you come around the other side, and you're on this margin of the Gondwana, there's Australia, here's the northern margin of Australia. Kalkaringi, Bill? Oh, yeah. Good enough. Uh, 505 to 510 million years ago is a, is a, 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 a vast pouring of mafic lava, uh, that's on the scale similar to the Columbia River Battle, a large igneous province. So maybe this is another manifestation. So as I, suggest, as, as I pointed out, this is just suggestions. There's no real solutions here. Um, maybe this is a way forward. So as I pointed out earlier, the proxy data strongly supports this, the, the uh, notion that, Pange, uh, that Panosia existed. There is some evidence for fundamental changes in mantle circulation 
along the margin of Gondwana, consistent with the presence of a slab graveyard that was, uh, that was significant enough to affect the, the deep mantle circulation with manifestations in the surface. Uh, what we're looking at here is consistent with geodynamic models of supercontinent uh, amalgamation. The opening of some of those enigmatic oceans that dominated the Paleozoic, that closed to give us Pangaea, some of those oceans may be um, related to the upwelling of some of those plumes. So the opening of Iapetus may be amalgamation of the Gondwanan portion of Pinocchio. Indeed, all supercontinents may actually rift apart in some locations before they fully amalgamated, because they'll tend to start rifting apart and spalling off terrains as soon as those plumes start to rise from the edges of these graveyards. So maybe we also have a way of figuring out how terrains originate, how some of these ge geological features actually originate. We concentrate a lot on how they accrete to margins, but maybe this gives us some insight uh, uh, of, of how they may form in the first place. Uh, the other uh, take-home message is we shouldn't get bent out of shape about definitions. I mean, quite frankly, if someone said, I don't think Pinocchio had the size to call it a supercontinent, that wouldn't bother me at all. It's the processes that are most important, I think. And we shouldn't be distracted by definitions and the size of the timing of amalgamation. We should be, I think, looking at whether it affected the Earth on such a grand scale, whether there's evidence for fundamental changes in mantle circulation. And perhaps the most important of all is that if you exclude Pinocchio from considering the supercontinent cycle, then you're taking a shortcut from Rodinia, the billion-year supercontinent, to Pangaea without considering the distortion to the early Paleozoic mantle circulation patterns that happened before Pangaea formed. And so, lastly, because I, I sort of uh, put you under the spell of blarney, I have to give you a finish up with an Irish blessing uh, that you may have, see in here, the hindsight to know where you come from, that you may have the foresight to know where you're going, and may you have the insight to know when you've gone much too far, <laughs> as I have. Thank you all for your attention.